The first five videos of this series covered biological developments in the Precambrian or Proterozoic era. The next three videos after that all pertain to the Cambrian. Then we had one episode focusing primarily on the Ordovician period and one for the Silurian. This video follows suit being concerned with developments in the subsequent period, the Devonian, also known as the Age of Fishes. Because regardless of all the diversity of fish that we've already shown from previous periods, the Devonian was when jawed vertebrates really proliferated. Unto this already eerie environment came armor-plated placoderms, as well as the most primitive sharks and the first bony fish, which were very different than what we have today. And some of these were big enough to be man-eaters. Devonian fish were quicker, faster, more maneuverable, and sometimes more powerful than anything else that had ever lived until that time. Thus, they dominated the seas, which until then were ruled by giant nautiloids like Camarosaurus and also Eurypterids, a large and varied group of massive scorpion-like arthropods. Imagine if you could take a holiday at the beach way back then. <laughs> you probably wouldn't even if you could. As we explained in an earlier episode, in the Ordovician period, way before this time, there was plenty of oxygen in the water thanks to cyanobacteria, which has been cranking out O2 all over the world for three billion years already. The oceans and the rocks were saturated with it, but there wasn't yet enough oxygen in the air for humans to breathe comfortably. There was way more carbon dioxide then too, which is a greenhouse gas, so the world was warmer than it is today. Paleoclimatologists trace isotopes in different strata to determine atmospheric content in those geologic periods. In the Silurian period, carbon dioxide was on its way down and oxygen was on its way up because now there were plants growing on dry land. These started with mosses and lichen-like liverworts that have to live in normally moist areas. But in the mid-Silurian, vasculated plants emerged and they could live anywhere. Thus, they proliferated unrestricted because there was as yet nothing to eat them. So they blanketed the planet, turning CO2 into O2 the way plants do. And following them came arthropods, creeping out of the water to explore and exploit this new environment. Together with the plants, they created a whole new ecosystem, so that by the Devonian period, the sky was blue and the land was green, green and pristine. And since there was, as yet, no terrestrial predators, or at least nothing indigenous, it was a virtual paradise, or a paleodice, if you will. The effect that plants had as they spread across the land was actually one of the most dramatic environmental changes to occur in the history of the world. Fluctuating climatic chemistry leads to instable conditions, which may explain the successive waves of mass extinctions that occurred during the Devonian. The exact causes are uncertain. There are 11 impact craters from this period, but no comet or meteor could explain this data. Throughout the Devonian, there were periods of widespread hypoxic or anoxic sedimentation indicating little or no oxygen in the seas. And some of these are known to be periods of mass extinction, and all of them are associated with the extinction of something or other. One hypothesis is that as plants converted sterile dirt into soil, nutrients washed off in the rain into the streams and then into the oceans. This fed enormous algae blooms, which in turn fed other microbes, which not only deplete oxygen from the water, but also produce hydrogen sulfide as a waste product, making vast areas of ocean both toxic and suffocating. Whatever happened, the Devonian ended with a loss of roughly 80% of the species that were there at the beginning of that period. So we have one species, evolving into two, and then four, eight, sixteen, and so on, such that a single taxonomic family could include thousands of individual species eventually, but it's not perpetually continuous, because many of these lineages will die off at different points for whatever reason. Life has to adhere to certain parameters. Maintaining an ecological equilibrium is like walking a tightrope. Now, whenever we first try to balance ourselves, uh, on something. We, we may teeter wildly, you know, in either direction before we stabilize, you know. And life does the same thing. If a dynamic environment topples into climate chaos or if organisms can't adapt to compensate to changing conditions, then it's over with and gone, extinct. Whatever species survive, then repeat the exponential proliferation of new species all over again. The last video showed the first jawed vertebrates branching into placoderms. In fact, the first jawed fish may have been a basal placoderm, which soon diverged into more modern fish without all that armor. That lineage branched further into the first sharks and also bony fish, as well as an intermediate stage between them. 
Sharks seem to have lost all their armor abruptly, apart from the sharp spines leading their dorsal fins, and those were eventually lost later in subsequent generations. Acanthodians typically retained those dorsal spines, as did some of the bony fish too. And this is a recurrent trait that is conserved in some modern fish as well, catfish for example. The earliest bony fish also adapted the gill covers, which we first see in basal Anchanthodians. They and Osteichthys both lost their armor too, albeit a bit more gradually than sharks did. Then Osteichthys divided again into Actinopterygii, which are your typical modern type ray fin fish, and Sarcopterygii, also known as Crossopterygii, which are lobed finned fish. Now, both of these groups had bony rays in their fins, but lobed fin fish typically had their fin rays at the ends of stubby little legs, supported by bones. These were the first fish with legs. As an example of a transitional intermediate, look at the base of Actinopterygian starting with polypteriforms. Some of their fins, though not all of them, are on these leg-like lobes. We still have polypteriforms today. In fact, I had one of these carnivorous fish as a pet for many years. But today they're about 10 inches long, but once upon a time they were 10 feet long. Remember, this lineage represents one of the earliest types of bony fish, so they don't have as much calcium in their bones as modern style of fish do. They're mostly cartilage. Uh, thus their remains are harder to fossilize. Larger animals fossilize easier than little ones too, so for every big organism like this, there's usually many more smaller species that we'll never find fossils for. This genus is known from only a single individual from the Upper Cretaceous period, but we know there had to be more than just one of them. There had to be enough to constitute a whole population. So how many millions more were alive at that time that never fossilized? We also know that they persisted beyond then too, because we have several smaller species from this family still around today. So how many millions of generations of millions of individuals at any one time have there been in the 70 million years or so since this one that we've never found and may never find? We also know that this isn't the first one because their phylogenetic placement is so basal, so primitive, that they must have emerged much earlier than this, probably in the Devonian. In basal sarcopterygians, we see the same thing, albeit a bit better represented. Looking at examples of the earliest bony fish ever discovered, we see those dorsal spines retained in the most basal and transitional examples of this clade. Now take a look at their tails. If you remember from the last episode, anaspids had merged a dorsal fin with a downbent tail to create a crescent caudal fin. Nathostomes did the opposite, adding a lower fin to an upwardly bent tail. Sarcopterygians balanced that back into a straight and symmetrical tail by duplicating a lower fluke too, so that they had a sort of trident caudal fin. Other Sarcopterygians later lost those spines in the tail. Sarcopterygians diverged into two stems, beginning with the so-called pillar of that clade. The famous coelacanth is not a species, it's a taxonomic family represented by at least nine or ten genera, distributed across the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and even Cenozoic eras. And this last genus is not found in the fossil record at all, but in two living and also endangered species, one critically so. Yet these survivors are still more primitive than some of their more advanced kinsmen that went extinct hundreds of millions of years ago. Their sister clade is Ripidistia. Although one of the Ripidistian subgroups is commonly known as lungfish, both lineages actually developed symmetrical lungs, but lungfish sort of lost the strength in their limbs. Now this shows that evolution doesn't always result in an improvement. By comparison to the often spindly reeds that are some lungfish arms, their sister clade, Tetrapodomorpha, increased their limb strength substantially. They had something most other fish don't have, a humerus bone articulating in the socket of a skeletal shoulder. Fish with shoulders. This clade includes Eustinopteron, a much faster and much more efficient hunter than any coelacanth. These were once thought to have been the very first fish to walk on land, even though they weren't really adapted to that at all. But then we discovered a lot more transitional species that were, and which taught us a couple of surprises about that transition, and I'll explain about that in the next video. For right now, remember that the word fish doesn't have a consistent taxonomic definition, which is why we say chordate or vertebrate instead. So if you followed along so far, do you understand and accept that having limbs and with bones in them, in addition to your backbone and spinal cord, plus your cranium and jaw, all made out of calcium, collectively means that you're cladistically classified as a sarcopterygian? 
Do you understand why having all that in addition to symmetrical lungs means you're ripidistian? And do you understand that having all these traits combined in addition to a funny bone in a shoulder socket means that you're also a tetrapodomorph? If you don't get all that, it's okay. The next stages of development that we'll talk about in the next video will give you a much better grasp of that.